Up to this point, we've been looking at material properties in isolation, but in this example, we're going to look at two properties that are connected, and I'll explain this a bit further as we go along. First of all, let's consider the bike frame that's shown, and let's consider the forces that are likely to be acting on this bike frame. First of all, we're going to have upward forces at the rear wheel and the front wheel. We're going to have the mass or the weight of the user acting down, and the user is also going to be applying forces at the pedals. Now the simplest way to evaluate this is to consider it as a pin jointed framework. And what that means is that each of these trusses that we've drawn can only exert either a compressive or tensile force. So they can only apply linear forces, each of these trusses. So when it comes to evaluating this bike frame, what we're actually considering is direct loading. Now first of all we're going to want this framework to be strong, we're going to want it to have a high strength. So we want high strength and if you recall the symbol for strength or for stress is sigma. So we need it to have high strength. The other thing that we're going to want is we're going to want this frame to be stiff. Because it's being subjected to a number of forces the last thing we want is for this frame to twist. So we want high stiffness. And if you recall, we said that means it needs a high elastic modulus. Now the third factor that we're going to consider is the mass or the density of the material that's used. If we were looking to produce a high performance bicycle, then we would want the frame to be light to improve performance. So we want low density. So in actual fact, we're going to consider two things. We're going to consider strength per unit mass. You've probably heard of strength to weight ratios before. And we're also going to consider stiffness per unit mass. So first of all, we need a formula for the mass of this bike frame. And mass is density times volume. Density times volume of the framework. Now, if we assume that this framework is of equal cross section throughout, then what we can say is that the mass of that framework is the density of the material used times the cross sectional area of the tubing times the overall length of the tubing. We're making some assumptions there because it's actually unlikely that the cross section throughout that frame would be equal. So we'll call that formula one. And another formula that we're interested in is the formula for stress or for strength. Stress is the applied force over the area. Now what we want to do is combine these two equations because at the moment we have a formula that involves stress and we have a formula that involves density but we want a combined formula or a way of evaluating strength over density or stress over density. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange equation one and I'm going to rearrange it to make A the subject. And the reason I'm going to do that is because both of our equations contain A. So I'm going to take equation one. First of all, I'm going to rewrite it. Mass equals, instead of density area length, I'm going to write density length area. And the reason I'm doing that is because it's easier then to rearrange. We can see that we need to divide each side by density times length. We'll be left with area equals mass over density times length. Now I'm going to substitute that formula into equation 2. So we can write 1 into 2. And I'm going to rewrite that as stress equals force divided by area. Well if area is going on the bottom or m over rho l is going on the bottom, then m will go on the bottom and rho L will actually go on the top. But if you recall, we said that we wanted to minimise the mass. So what I'm going to do is rearrange that now to get mass on its own. And the way I do that is by timesing each side by M and then dividing each side by sigma. So I'll get M equals F rho L over sigma. I'm going to rewrite that because I want to group density and sigma together. So instead I'm going to write F L times rho over sigma. 
So finally, if I want to minimize M, I need to minimize rho over sigma. The reason being is the force is going to be a constant and the length of the tube is going to be a constant. The only two parameters there that are affected by the material is the density and the strength of the material. Now if I want to minimize the mass by minimizing rho over sigma, then that's exactly the same as saying I'm minimizing the mass by maximizing sigma over rho. I'm just inverting that fraction. So what we're looking to do in this example is we're looking to maximize sigma over rho. It is worth mentioning that the indice for each of those, sigma is to the power one, and density is also to the power one. And that's going to influence how we use the chart. The reason why I mention this is sometimes when you go through this process, one of these powers or one of these indices may end up being two or three. And this is why using material indices can sometimes become a little bit complicated. We have a relatively straightforward example because we have direct loading, but if you had bending or torsion as an example, then you would have to reconsider the material indices. But that's sufficient as an introduction. Let's look at how this impacts on our graph. So here we have a graph of strength against density. And once again, this has been produced using CES EduPack 2017 by Granta Design Limited. And recall that our goal here is to maximize sigma over rho, strength over density. When we looked at the material indice, we found that we would have a material indice of one because we have direct loading. Well, a material indice of one is represented on this graph by a gradient of one, a line with a gradient of one. So let's look at what that means. When we go from on our y-axis 10 to 100, we've increased tenfold. And when we go on our x-axis from 10 to 100, we've increased tenfold. Therefore, any line that connects the two corners of any of these squares is going to be a gradient of one. So we could draw a line there, it would be a gradient of one. We could draw a line here, corner to corner, and it would have a gradient of one. And let's begin by drawing a line here. Now what this means is every material on this line would have an equivalent strength to weight or strength to density ratio. So all of these materials in effect would perform equally for strength over mass or strength over density. Now if we want to maximize that ratio, we need to move that line with gradient one upwards for maximizing. So let's draw a second line. And this time we'll cross the corners of the next box like so. What you notice now is that there's very few materials still in the running. We can see that carbon fiber reinforced polymer, here as an example, would perform very similar to diamond in terms of strength to weight ratio. But we can see various other materials, such as our steels are underperforming, and also our aluminium alloys here are underperforming. Now obviously we would rule out diamond, it's very expensive and it's very difficult to form. So really the material that's left in terms of strength to weight ratio is the composite material carbon fiber reinforced polymer. So for a high performance bike, we're probably looking at carbon fiber reinforced polymer as our material. We're going to look at another chart and this time we're going to look at elastic modulus against density. And we're not going to go through the process of determining the indice again, but the indice will once again be one as we have direct loading. So this is the final graph that we're going to look at. And again, it's been produced using the CES EduPack 2017. And what we have this time is our Young's modulus or our stiffness on the Y axis and our density on the X axis. We're looking for a material with high stiffness, low density, or we're trying to maximize the relationship of E over rho, elastic modulus over density. Now each of these are going to be to the power of one. So once again, we need a line with gradient one. Lines with gradient one connect the corners of these rectangles. So we can sketch a line on here and all of the materials that sit on that line 
would perform equally in terms of stiffness over density. Because we want to maximise that relationship again, we need to move this line upwards in this direction. And we're looking for the material or materials that perform best in terms of that ratio. So as we move this in that direction, what we notice is we get to a point where there's very few materials remaining. Once again, I'm going to overlap our carbon fibre reinforced polymer. So let's just add a line here. So overlapping our carbon fibre reinforced polymer there, we can see very few materials that are still in the running. And in fact, the only other materials are ceramics. Now there's a number of different problems with ceramics. They're difficult to form, but they're also relatively brittle. So once again, if we're trying to optimise the design of our bike frame, we're only really left with one possible material, and that's the composite material, carbon fibre reinforced polymer. So let's summarise. So in order to optimise the design of our bike frame, we wanted to maximise stress over density, and we wanted to maximise elastic modulus over density. When we looked at stress over density, we considered a number of different materials. We considered carbon fibre reinforced polymer. We also discussed alloys of aluminium. And we also discussed steel. Now the reasons why we discussed aluminium alloys and steel is because bike frames are often also made from those materials. The cheaper bikes tend to be made from steel. Then we have aluminium alloys and the most expensive bikes tend to be made from carbon fibre reinforced polymer. Now when we evaluated the strength per unit density, what we found was that carbon fibre reinforced polymer outperformed both the aluminium alloys and the steel. And then we did a second evaluation where we looked at the stiffness per unit density, and once again, we found that the carbon fibre reinforced polymer outperformed the other two materials. So why then are the cheapest bikes made from steel? Once again, it's going to come down to the ease of manufacture and hence the cost. So the materials are cheaper and they're easier to manufacture. When we consider aluminium alloys, the reason why aluminium alloys are used is because they have low density. They tend to be relatively strong, but also very light. But by far the strongest, stiffest and lightest materials are the carbon fibre reinforced polymers. The cost of those is greater because the manufacturing process is much more complex. And we'll look at various different manufacturing processes in a later tutorial.